Inside the Mind of a Serial Killer panel with John Ross. Thank you for Hi. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for coming. How are you? Yeah. Good morning. I'm waking up. I'm sure everybody else is. So. Thanks for coming this early in the morning. So let's just start off with uh, talk a little bit about your training as a filmmaker. So what I did, um, I went to Columbia College in Chicago. I always had a love for animals, so I thought, okay, you know, I mean, I thought I was going to go into zoology, which was weird, but, you know, I, I didn't think being a filmmaker was attainable because, you know, at that time, you know, there wasn't digital video, there was film. I mean, you did have video was, you know, in its infancy, but it was still really expensive. So, um, you know, in high school, I would do makeup effects, and I thought, okay, you know, I could go into special makeup because I always enjoyed, uh, you know, Dick Smith and Tom Savini's work, and, you know, and when I was doing special makeup effects in high school with a friend of mine, he said, well, you have to come over. Now, his father was a detective uh, when Dahmer was arrested. So I thought, okay, you know, I came over there and he's like, you have to see this. And he thought it was a catalog from one of these makeup companies. And what it was is his father actually had the Dahmer file with photocopies of all these pictures of the heads on the sink and... You know, they were just atrocious images, so I couldn't get those images out of my head, and eventually I did a film once I was in college in filmmaking school called State of Mind, and it's on YouTube. You can check it out, and it's, you know, a short film based on Dahmer and the confession that I read. So, you know, and I eventually did go to Columbia College and studied filmmaking there, started on actual 16 millimeter film, and, you know, progressed to video editing you know, after that, and um, the rest is kind of history. While I was in college, I was doing a report on Chicago history, and I read about this castle of H.H. H. Holmes in Chicago, and I thought, wow, this is a fascinating story. But then I found another book, which, you know, really fleshed out Holmes's life, where he was, you know, he went to medical school in Michigan and had these three wives at the same time that didn't know of each other, and then he had mistresses, and I thought, okay, this isn't just some diabolical madman that built this building. He was an evil genius, and they've never made a film on him. And I didn't even know there was a book coming out called Devil in the White City, and that was, you know, uh, it, it, that was released just before my film came out. So they've kind of helped each other in the long run. So, and, you know, after H.H. H. Holmes, it, it was, it, I just moved on to more serial killers from there. It was like, okay, you know, who do I top that? And then I did Albert Fish after that. What do you think it is about uh, the killers, the mass murders, that gain such notoriety, and that why people are, are, are so obsessed with the, with the killer culture? Yeah, I think you know. I think many people are fascinated by serial killers. I think the majority of people are, but um, for some reason, you know, many people don't want to admit that. You know, uh, who knows? You know, I mean, it may be the same thing as horror fans. You know, being labeled strange or weird. You know, because you're interested in this topic, but there's nothing wrong with it. You know, um, but in in the past, the news, the media has really created many of these serial killers as celebrities. You know, Life magazine had many of them on the covers. You know, People magazine had Dahmer on the covers, the most intriguing person of the year. So, um, you know, there's there's I think there's a general interest, but then the media also when when we do hear more information about these serial killers, we gain interest, and sometimes. You know, the more morbid and, and you know psychologically disturbed, the more interesting they are, or at least to me, you know. <clears throat> Out of the three that you've documented so far, which one might have been particularly hard for you to sort of research and, and get into uh, some of the things that they have done? Yeah, I would say um, Albert Fish, because to me, he's really the most deranged and depraved, because, you know, he not only did, uh, you know, vile things to children and tortured children, but he also tortured himself, you know, so here was someone that, you know, I, I'd never heard of that in other serial killers, you know, and he had this whole, you know, s &M issue that he said went back to uh, the orphanage when he was age seven, where he was forced to watch little boys being whipped, and he was whipped, and he himself said in his confessions that he had his first sexual feeling at age seven, so then... You know, it's no wonder that when you look forward in his life, he's writing women saying, oh, you know, can I whip you, will you whip me, you know, and he would put ads in the newspapers. So many of these serial killers, you know, I feel um, the environmental factors, especially between ages like 7 and 12, play a key role in their development. And 
Fish was stuck in that orphanage for his entire life. Kind of going off of that, what do you think uh, affects it more? Is it, is it, is it genetic? Is it, is, it, is it nature or is it nurture? Yeah, you know, there are many theories and we still don't have an answer. You know, some people think it's brain injury. Um, there were many serial killers that were studied. Uh, Gacy's brain was studied uh, by his psychiatrist after uh, he willed it to her. And uh, she studied it and found no abnormalities. So we still don't know. I mean, my theory is, you know, some people believe it's genetic, head injuries, um, environmental. I, I do feel environment, as far as what I've studied, these serial killers, especially Albert Fish and Carl Panzram, that it was, you know, environmental factors play a key role in their development. And you can really see that with Carl Panzram. And there's an author named Stephen Giannagello who wrote a book called Real Life Monsters. And uh, it, he has a theory that it might not be abuse, it may be trauma that could have been suffered at an early age by, you know, some of these youths growing up. And, you know, that kind of sets the course for the rest of their life. And with Panzram, it was just a total, you know, uh, you know cruelty and uh, revenge issue, a vicious circle with him for his entire life. So then, um, talk about 2004, the Wichita police uh, contacted you about the BTK investigation. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, there was a killer called BTK, and his initial stood for buying, torture, and kill. And he he was he would write the press and the media when he was conducting his murders, and uh, he disappeared for a long time. Well, then he resurfaced again uh, many years later, and when he resurfaced. I was contacted by the Wichita Police Department because they wanted to subpoena all my records. Because many of these serial killers do know of the serial killers that have come before them. So BTK had written about Jack the Ripper and H.H. Holmes and about numerous other serial killers. So the police department thought, okay, well, you know, let's subpoena the records, John Borowski's records of the people that have purchased the H.H. Holmes DVD in Kansas. So they did that. So, you know, I tried to help them out. And then after that, they said, well, maybe we'll have a film screening of H.H. H. Holmes. They were trying to do anything. You know, they couldn't catch this guy. So they thought if they had a screening, sometimes these ser serial killers or criminals, you know, return to the scene of their crime, or they may, you know, come to one of these screenings, and they would have videotaped it and tried to review the evidence and find out, you know, who this BTK killer was. Um, but what happened was they apprehended him before they had the screening. So, I, you know, I, I played a small part in it, in, in their investigation, but not ultimately, you know, his uh, apprehension. You know, I do want to ask you that, do you think primarily most of them do want to be caught? You know, that maybe killing is not enough, that they want the recognition because BTK disappeared, like you said, for so many years and he got away with it essentially. But then it seemed like he had to come back and he made a pretty stupid mistake after being so smart for so many years. So do you think it's inherent in them that they want the recognition to be caught? You know, uh, they, one of the things serial killers love is attention, you know? And, you know, I think he was craving it after, after that long of a time period, you know, maybe feeling ignored or, you know, some other people were discussing the case and then he had to write the authorities and he had, uh, they keep mementos and he had some, uh, you know, he had a driver's license from one of his victims, I believe, and he either sent it to the authorities or the news media or photocopied it to prove that, yes, I am the BTK, you know, and I'm back, you know. And it's like H.H. H. Holmes, you know, once he was apprehended, he loved reading about himself in the newspaper every day, you know. And it's, it's a continual cycle with them. And now there's an author by the name of Catherine Ramsland, who's a forensic psychologist, um, She's in uh, my Albert Fish film and my film on Carol Panzeram. Now she's working with BTK and writing a book with him about his crimes. So again, it's, you know, on one hand they do want this attention, but on the other hand, I feel that, you know, if there are things to be learned from interviewing them, you know, we might as well take advantage of that, you know, when they are in prison. So why do you think there's a difference between people who, uh, sort of a stigma attached to people who want to learn more about uh, serial killers and, and, and those kind of crimes as opposed to uh, kind of really being more legitimately uh, recognized in, in society for people who want to go and learn about what the Nazis did in World War II, what the Japanese did to the Chinese in World War II and those atrocious things. Yeah, you know, I think, I, I, again, I think it's just, it's a common interest in, uh, 
you know, all these, uh, it, it's a, fashion, a fascination I think that everyone has, you know, when, whenever you're talking about, you know, either war crimes or atrocities committed on other people, you know, there's definitely an interest, but, but I, sometimes I feel that war is on a, a, you know, these things are on a grander scale and, and people may look into those, but when it's a serial killer, you could think about it and look at it from the perspective of, okay, this literally could be our neighbor. It could be our family member. You know, a friend of mine yesterday was showing me uh, a couple of pictures that surfaced of uh, BTK with his daughter, you know, at her wedding, you know, and at her graduation, literally before he was caught. So, you know, it looks like the monk shutter when he's sitting in the courtroom. So I think there's more of a fascination when it could be you <laughs> tomorrow, you know, me, you know, I'm, you know what I mean, you know what I'm saying, but, uh, you know, and uh, I think it's, it, there is a difference there, so, I mean, but, but if you're looking at it from like a collector standpoint, you know, I think it just depends on, you know, a person's interest, you know, what, what they're interested in, you know, and, and as you can see by watching serial killer culture, um, a lot of these, you know, murderabilia collectors or artists that do works on serial killers, myself included, we're always interested in horror films, you know, because when you think about it, these are our modern monsters, you know. Dracula was based on Vlad the Impaler, so a lot of these, even the early monster stories may have been based on real people or, you know, some of these fables or mythologies, but these are our modern, you know, werewolves, monsters. Albert Fish was called the werewolf of wisteria, you know, and, and vampire because he drank blood, so, but, you know, he's a human being. And, you know, I, the only thing I regret making all of my films was that in H.H. H. Holmes, I called him a monster because I do think we have to remember, even though they're, after they're caught and they're in prison, they're still human beings. They haven't turned, you know, into people with tails and horns and, you know, green skin. They're still human beings. And we just have to try and figure out why, you know, they got to that point because I believe their soul's in torment too for doing these things, you know. So before we sort of break down each of your films, you know, what goes into sort of dissecting each of these serial killers, the research, and sort of that process, talk about that? Yeah, it's definitely a tiered process. Um, the first part of research that I do is I try and find every book that's currently available or that has ever been written on a serial killer. So, um, you know, anything that's ever been in print, even if it's, if it's out of print, I'll trace it down. Uh, for H.H. H. Holmes, I found a copy of the Holmes Peitzel case, which was written by the detective who searched for the children, uh, the missing children, and I, I found that on eBay, so I used that as research. You know, there were some other books. Harold Schechter had a book out. There was a book from the 70s called The Torture Doctor, and I even found an actual LP album called The Murder Castle, an old-time radio show. So I... After I searched for books on the subject, then I moved to like pop culture. Okay, were there songs written about them? You know, I basically leave no stone unturned. And then after that, that's, that's when I moved to the real evidence, the case files, because some of these authors, you know, I, I worry that, you know, they, they may, may be some of the research on newspaper clippings. And newspapers are notorious. Like the newspapers, especially pre-1930 newspapers, they were like the Inquirer, you know, they would, you know, misquote things, misspell names, you know, so you can't, you couldn't really rely on the early newspapers because they were sensationalistic and still many times today. So I actually try and find the original case files, whether they're in a historical society or going through a law enforcement agency. Um, and like H.H. H. Holmes, most of the research, surprisingly, wasn't in Chicago, it was in Philadelphia where the trial was held because Chicago didn't have much information, you know, other than some of the newspapers when they first went into his building. So, and then after that, you know, I look at, okay, you know, who uh, I would like interviewed in the film. Is it a forensic expert? Is it a forensic psychologist? You know, an author who may have written a book, you know, uh, experts on the case. So, you know, that's how I go about the research and, and kind of planning and mapping out the film. And I also map out if there are any locations left from the, the actual crime. You know, uh, for instance, I track down the actual house where Albert Fish killed Grace Budd. It was a trap, you know, I took that same journey that Albert Fish took her on from New York to upstate New York. And even when I took it, I think it was at least an hour and a half. And I, and I had to take, you know, the L train, taxi, and walk. And, you know, it was kind of by luck that I had found it because it's in this, in this forested area. The only thing that's different is the roof on it. 
but I did find the actual house, and you know, people were living there. Not at the time that I went, and, you know, found it, but yeah, there were people inhabiting the house. So um, it, it is. It's a difficult process, and that's why sometimes these documentaries take anywhere. They could take anywhere from three to five years, depending on, you know. And it, the good thing though is. While I'm making the documentary, there are people that do contact me. Sometimes it may be uh, descendants, you know, of some of these serial killers, or other people that have, you know, evidence or, or case files that I can use in the film, or, or direction that they could provide me, in, you know, in my research. What well, made you pick the three uh, serial killers that you did that, that you make the films about? So H. H. Holmes was kind of obvious. I'm from Chicago. He was in Chicago. I heard about his building, and I thought, okay, you know, the fact that no one had done a film on him, but it was extremely difficult because there were, there weren't many photos of Holmes. I think there were maybe two or three, you know. And I figured, okay, I could do expert interviews. I wanted to do a feature film, but of course, you know, just coming out of college, I didn't have a, you know a budget for a period piece picture from you know in the 1890s. It's like, okay, yeah, that would have been really ambitious. They still haven't even made the film today. You know, Tom Cruise had the rights, and DiCaprio has it, and I haven't heard any more about it. Um, so I thought, okay, I'll do H.H. H. Holmes. So after H.H. H. Holmes, I, I didn't, it wasn't trying to top him, but, you know, I, I looked at other serial killers, and, you know, I'm not, I'm interested in contemporary serial killers, but sometimes there has been so much coverage on them, I figure, well, why should I do another documentary? Even though mine may be a definitive, but it's like, okay, there are many out there. So I do like pre-1940s serial killers when uh, forensic science was in its infancy. And crime detection was really tried and true detective work. You know, Detective Geiger that tracked down the bodies of uh, the missing children that Holmes had murdered, he went state to state, door to door, knocking on doors. You know, he didn't rely on CSI techniques. You know, so they're, I think they're more fascinating from those perspectives. So then I picked Albert Fish because no one had ever done a film on Albert Fish in any way. And then um, Carl Panzram, I thought, okay, you know, his, his story intrigued me. And I thought, you know, when I initially researched his case, when you go on the internet and look up Carl Panzram, you're going to find the same material regurgitated all over the internet where, okay, it's Carl Panzram, you know, spewing his hatred at the world. But then when you move forward and, and look at his relationship with this one person that was kind to him, the jail guard, Henry Lesser, who gave him a dollar bill, you know, and actually listened to him and spoke to him like a human being instead of, you know, some kind of animal in a cage, you know, then he wrote, he wrote his life story for the jail guard, trying to leave us with a lesson on how to teach our children not to raise more monsters like he was. Now, I thought that was fascinating. I've never seen any of these other serial killers being that introspective, wondering why they are the way they are. He, you know, he even said, well, maybe you could talk to some psychologists and ask them, tell them my case, give them my autobiography. And you know, towards the end, you really feel sorry for this man who was kind of abandoned by society. And many people say, well, he was a serial killer. You can't feel sorry for him. Well, I have no proof. I have found no proof that that he was a serial killer. That's why in my film I kind of leave it ambiguous. You know, he says he murdered 21 people, but you can't kill that he murdered these a Africans and fed them to the crocodiles. You can't, I can only prove that he killed the laundry foreman at Leavenworth. And I feel he did that because he wanted to bring about his own death penalty. He did, he said it, I don't want to live in this world. So he killed the laundry foreman, he received the death penalty, he was executed, that's what he wanted. He brought about his own death, it was a form of suicide. He said he was done with this world, he hated it. But when you look at his upbringing, and that's why I structured the film in that way, the first half is really all about his hatred and what he went through. And the second half is you know, him trying to come to terms with his life and not wanting to live anymore and how to find a way out of it. You know, and even when he was in Leavenworth, he tried suicide several times. You know, um, but it, so that's why I chose Piantra. I thought, okay, you know, here's a serial killer that's trying to leave us with a lesson. And then uh, serial killer culture came about because as I was making my other films, I was meeting many people involved in this culture. You know, whether they were murderabilia collectors or artists doing works on serial killers. And I thought, you know, there was a film out, I think it was maybe early 90s, called Collectors. But, you know, it wasn't, I, I you know, it, it, it was a decent film, but I thought, okay, we need an updated version of this. You know, and so that's when I began interviewing people and collecting these interviews. As I was finishing up Panzeram, I started filming serial killer culture. 
interviewing. Uh, you know, I, I went to Joe Hiles from SK Central as well, and uh, you know, asked him what he might recommend, and he turned me out to the, the Crawl Space Brothers, who did songs on Serial Killers, and um, you know, some of these other artists I had known, and Rick Staten, of course, uh, you know, was a major collector that I, you know, had heard about for a long time. And he's interviewed, he was in the film, he was Gacy's art dealer. So that's how serial killer culture came about. And I thought, okay, you know, the time is right for that. So going back to H.H. H. Holmes, uh, <clears throat> Hollywood sort of has a way of depicting serial killers as very intelligent, sophisticated. Uh, you know, we always kind of go back to Hannibal Lecter. Uh, normally that's not the case with, with serial killers, but with H.H. H. Holmes it was. He was I think you said he was one of the only serial killers that finished college. So talk about what makes him so different uh, from, from everybody else that you've talked about. You know, that the majority, I think, of serial killers, you know, are on a genius level. I mean, Ed Kemper definitely was, you know, Ed, they never did a test on Holmes, but, you know, he obviously, in my mind, he was an evil genius to design and build this building to dispose of human remains. No other serial killer had done that. He had literally laid the groundwork for all the others to come after that. Um, you know, I think Dahmer was also at a genius level. Um, but then you have others like Albert Fish, who I don't believe he was a genius, but he was definitely deceptive and devious to trick this family into letting them take their daughter with him. You know, building this trust by going there, you know, several times and meeting with the family. So it, you know, but Holmes definitely um, was way ahead of his time for what he did as a serial killer and as a master manipulator. Um, you know, he knew when he was going on that whole cross country journey, you know, taking these children and uh, the the mother of the children and his third wife deciding where he's going to kill them all. You know, his intention was to wipe out this entire family and keep the entire insurance money for himself. Um, so, you know, in his case, he definitely was extremely unique as, you know, a serial killer and as a master manipulator. Now, there are serial killers, they have different motivations. Holmes was definitely mainly money motivated. It was all profit. It was real estate scams, life insurance scams, you know, if you look at, and he was a hands-off serial killer, there is a theory that, going out there, that, you know, he may have been Jack the Ripper. There's a theory every week on, you know, a, a, someone who maybe may have been Jack the Ripper. You know, every week there's a new one. Um, in the end, we'll never know, you know, but I feel uh, it doesn't fit Holmes's motivation. You know, it's, it's not his M.O. Because, you know, he felt he was above people and he was superior to them. And to him, the fun was planning these murders, tricking these, the little girls to get into the trunk so he could gas them. You know, for him, I don't think he would find any fun going all the way to England and, you know, murdering poor prostitutes when he could have done that in Chicago. So um, it didn't fit his MO, but, you know, and that's why I think... Holmes is still, and, and it, it's still my bestseller, and it, it's still, I think people will be, you know, fascinated with him for the rest of eternity because he was this evil genius. And people try and wrap their arms around him. I wonder, you know, if uh, women are especially interested in the case to try and figure out what was it about Holmes that, you know, made these women enamored by him. You know, the three wives, the mistresses. He would kill his mistresses for money or property, but he never killed his wives. And people ask me, well, why don't you think he killed his wives? I think he was such a forward thinker that he needed, he, everyone was upon him, so he needed somebody in place in case he was ever arrested. And sure enough, when he was arrested, the press went to his second wife, you know, who was set up in a nice house in the suburbs of, you know, Chicago, well met in a house with her child. You know, the press interviewed them, and, and she said, well, you know, I don't know what he does in that building in Chicago, but he's never harmed me or my child. Well, why would she say anything wrong about him, even if she knew some of these things that were going on, if she knew about the murders? But, you know, he, he had his wives in place, you know, and, and so he knew that, okay, these mistresses he might be able to kill and, you know, get away with it and get under the radar and, you know, have them sign away their property or life insurance. Thing. So, uh, fire took the H.H. H. Holmes castle. Um, what's standing there now, do you feel it's kind of bittersweet uh, that it's not there to be an attraction? Well, what happened with the H.H. H. Holmes castle is, initially, the top floor was burned. 
no one knows who burned that top floor. You know, um, sometimes in these cases, either outraged locals or, you know, some other people involved with the crimes may try and wipe out the evidence. The same thing happened in Gaines Farm. It was burned down because, you know, nobody wanted, you know, evidence of these atrocities. Dahmer's apartment building was raised, you know. Um, but uh, the building actually existed. Other than that top floor being burned down, the building existed because I have a photo from the Chicago Tribune from 1931. That's when they demolished that building. And you can see it on the first floor, it says sign. So there, were some, there was a sign shop on the first floor. So it did exist for a while, but then after they demolished it, they erected a post office on the site. So now there's a post office there. And I went in there one time and I asked the employees, I'm like, you know, do you know what this is? They know the history of it. And they say they do hear noise, strange noises in the basement. So, you know, that's a whole nother, I'm not, I'm not into the paranormal, I'm into the true facts on the case. So that's what's going on there at the site. So the building did exist for a while, other than that top floor. Uh, it's funny that he was operational during the, the World's Fair. Do you think, honestly, we'll ever know the true number of people that he may have taken and killed in, in the castle? That's the difficult part with many of these serial killers. Albert Fish as well. We don't know how many he could have killed. You know, he traveled the country as a painter, you know, and said he had children all across the U.S. Whether he meant he molested them, tortured them, or murdered them, we'll never know, you know. But Holmes, we will never know. Harold Schechter, who I interviewed in the documentary, he said he could definitively say about nine, because, you know, the Peitzel family, the children, um, the Williams sisters, who, you know, Holmes, uh, who Holmes had a relationship with as well. So, you know, we could possibly say nine, but we'll never know. He had a crematorium in the bas in the basement, you know, uh, that he said he used for glass bending, but it was the size, it was basically the size of a human body, you know. Um, he had acid bats, quicklime bats, he would sell skeletons to medical schools and universities. So in the end, we'll never know. There were many, you know, young women that came to Chicago to visit the World's Fair, and they never, you know, they just disappeared. There were many people that did disappear at that time. You know, Holmes began these life insurance scams when he was in college. So by the time he came to Chicago, he was kind of a pro at disposing of bodies or, you know, uh, manipulating corpses for life insurance scams. We'll never know. So uh, talk about Albert Fish and, and I mean, his things that he did is just unbelievable at times. So what did you learn uh, going into research that and uh, when you did, did it turn out even worse than you expected it to? Yeah, Albert Fish, you, you hear some of these things, okay, you know, the, uh, the elderly cannibal, you hear some of these things, but, you know, as I did further research and, and you know, looked into uh, the case of his psychiatrist, Dr. Frederick Wortham, who wrote a book, and, you know, Wortham is, is famous for many years later going after, which, you know, he went on this tirade against the, the Tales from the Crypt comic book saying they were bad for children, but that came later, and he did eventually apologize for that. But early in his career, he was the head psychiatric a psychiatrist at Bellevue in New York, and that's how he got involved in the Albert Fish case. So, you know, um, that was one of the parts of research, reading part of his book, he had a chapter, Masks Have No Ears, about Albert Fish. Um, so, you know, reading his interviews with Albert Fish and some of Albert Fish's confessions, and then I went to do further interviews, uh, not interviews, I'm sorry, uh, further research with newspapers from the time period. But, you know, it was just this constant unfolding. They had to, you know, create new perversions just for Albert Fish. They call them for perversions at that time, but they had to create some. There's this long list that I, uh, I published a book uh, recently with many of Fish's confessions and actual case files in it. And on one of the first pages, it's just a long list of all these you know, so-called perversions that he had. And I just thought it was amazing that they had to create some because anything you could name involving you know, S&M or you know, uh, you know, the depravity of a serial killer, Albert Fish did it. I mean, you know, it's just, you know, and, and especially when you're watching my documentary, you're seeing these things unfold, and it's just unbelievable. It gets to a point where it, you couldn't believe, I, you know, even to the point where he had a religious complex. So, you know, one of his sons said they saw him standing on a, a hill yelling, I am Christ, he had, because he had this religious complex where he thought 
he was doing good by sending these children to heaven, by killing them before they were violated, drinking their blood and eating their flesh like communion. You know, and in his mind, you know, he may have thought he was doing the right thing, which is which is pretty scary. But again, you know, many of these serial killers are found sane because society wants to execute them as revenge for what they did, you know, to their victims. And that's what happened to Albert Fish. And there's a big urban myth that he, he had well, he did have 29 needles in his body that he stuck inside, you know, behind his perineum, and they showed up on an x-ray. The authorities didn't believe him, so they took him to the hospital and x-rayed his abdomen. And the big urban myth is that he shorted out the electric chair. So again, you know, I, you know, someone said I'm like a pit bull in my research, that once I grab people, I don't let go, you know, and... Uh, I found the book of Albert Fish's Executioner in which he had a section where he said nothing unusual happened. It was over in a couple minutes. So, you know, some people still want to believe those urban myths because it is kind of more interesting. Oh, yeah, did you know that old man shorted out the electric chair with all these needles in his body? But it didn't really happen. You know, so I have to stick to the tried and true research and the facts when I research these cases. Maybe I read uh, one time, maybe you can clear this up for me, that he got a lot of his confession to the lawyer, and the lawyer would, his attorney would read them in the courtroom. But there were even maybe, maybe a couple of cases where he, he himself wouldn't actually uh, turn them over to the judge and have them read them. Did, did you, did you know about that? Yeah, you know, some of those, you know, in, in the book that I published, what happened is in 2010, for his psychiatrist, Dr. Frederick Wortham's files were open. They were sealed until 2010. So what I did was I went to the Library of Congress and I scanned all of these documents and I released them in my new book. And there are some confessions that he had never talked about, mainly torturing other children, not murdering other children. But the, you know there was another little boy that was kidnapped named Billy Gaffney in New York. And no one ever knows you know, if Fish actually did it, even though he did confess that they never found a body of this little boy. But you know, I, I found the New York tenement building where supposedly Albert Fish, you know, took the little, where the little boy was playing in the hallway of his tenement building and he took him out the fire escape. So I filmed that building. And, you know, I'm kind of like a guerrilla filmmaker. I just rang everybody's bell in the building. Somebody buzzed me in and I just went in with my video camera and I filmed the whole hallway from top to bottom, you know. And what's interesting also is that he was the original boogeyman because the other little boy that was playing with Billy Gaffney when he was kidnapped said the boogeyman took him. And he described this old man, you know, and, it, and it's just frightening when you think about it because he was actually the original stranger of danger because at that time, you know, they weren't teaching children about these things. They were playing in the streets. There were many children that disappeared and murdered, you know, and, it, you know, once these killers are caught, you know, it, I, I wish they would all be like, you know, a Dahmer and just sit down and say, okay, here's how many I killed. Here, here's their names. Here's how it happened. You know, and, and they're, they're truthful and they, you know, but then you have ones like Casey who go into their attorney's office and do confess, but then after, no, 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 I never, ever, ever did these things. It wasn't me, you know, I didn't know what that smell was, those 33 bodies, I don't know how they got there, you know, I was just living there. You know, it's like, you know, I, I wish they were all, you know, <laughs> up front with these things, but Albert Fish was the same way. And, but, you know, he had a family, you know, he had grandchildren, so maybe, you know, there was at that time, you know, once he was apprehended, maybe there was that shame and all these things were coming about. Who knows, you know, but again, that shows that they are still humans, you know, even after they're apprehended. So, moving to Carl Pantram, uh, I know you guys were talking a little earlier about nature versus nurture. Um, I think <clears throat> this is the ultimate story of society made him what he was. And, like you said at the end, I, after watching it, I sort of, I felt bad for him. Talk a little bit about the difference between him and maybe someone that, you know, like Fish that enjoyed it rather than, you know, being made to be that way. Yeah, Panzer, I, I do feel he was created. You know, he was a man-made monster, um, you know, especially it, it, was, it was almost as if, you know, his life was meant to be that way. You know, when he was a child, he, he was uh, <clears throat> the youngest of a large family. Uh, you know, the mother was the only parent. He didn't get enough attention. So, of course, you know, being the youngest, he's, he's going to want this attention that he isn't getting. His brothers would, you know, fight with him all the time and beat him up. And to get attention, what he did was, when he was 12 years old, he broke into a neighbor's house and stole a gun. You know, and then he's thrown into a red wing. 
So at Red Wing, he said that's where you know his his life really began. That's where he learned you know about you know murder, burning, you know torturing, because he was you know treated awful there. There's at, when he was at Red Wing, it, which was a reform school. Um, well, it was actually a correctional institution for you know young men, and it still exists. I went there, and in the Panzerham DVD and the extras, I interviewed the current superintendent at Red Wing. And when I went there now, they, they don't call them inmates, they call them residents. So when I went there, you know, he said, okay, well, we'll, let, we'll have a couple of residents take you on a tour. And I'm thinking, wait, you're, you're just going to let me, you're going to leave me with a couple of these, you know, teen criminals? You know, but they have different levels, you know. So it, it was refreshing that when I did go on the tour, how they showed, okay, the first place we walked into was a classroom, and they were, these kids were being taught acting class. So I thought, okay, they're not whipping them. They're actually treat, teaching them. So we have progressed. But as they took me on the tour, you know, the last stop was the most depressing, where it was the lockdown, where they have, you know, they're staring at you through, you know, these little glass doors. And, you know, that was the most depressing part of it. But, um, you know, it's definitely changed since Panzerham's time period. But when he was there, you know, whippings and beatings were normal. So they would have these punishment slips. And there's one punishment slip that Karl Panzerham received that to me was indicative of his entire life. And at the top it said, you know, crime attempted to escape. So he did try and run away from there. And then what was the punishment? Have a spanking. And when, his whole life when he was in these prisons, either he would try and escape, and he did escape from some of them, and then what would happen, he would be beaten or tortured or whipped or put in a bathtub and electrocuted. So, you know, this treatment just, you know, grew the rage within him. When he was young, he rode the rails, and he was raped by hobos. So it's no wonder that the objects of his hatred were men. He never harmed a woman, never in his life. You know, there's a film with James Woods based on Panzerham called Killer, Journal of Murder, which I haven't seen. I've seen some of it, but I heard it was highly inaccurate. When I heard that, they have a scene where Panzerham rapes a female librarian. Already, I don't want to see the film because I know he never did that. You know, he never harmed a woman. You know, and so you could see how he was created. And he was also abandoned by society because here he was in a, a correctional institution for young children where he's supposed to be taught, but they just grew, made his rage worse by beating him. You know, they said they, he would be sent to the paint shop where they would beat him black and blue. They call, that's why they call it the paint shop because they came out like with black and blue on them. And as revenge, what did he do? He burned down that building. You know, so already he had that cycle of escape and revenge and punishment. And that was his entire life. What's fascinating, you know, I mean, he was like the ultimate, you know, criminal. We hear Dillinger and some of these other bad guys. I don't think any of them compared to Panzram as being a bad guy. How many criminals do you know of that broke into a prison to rescue another prisoner? He did. He got into the prison. He was caught just to rescue somebody else out. But he was a real tough guy. You know, one of these guys that, you know, uh, you know, toppled these insurmountable odds and almost superhuman strength. But, you know, he wasn't a really huge guy. You know, he was probably around 5'10", you know, he had a, a had a build, but, you know, he, there was nothing, you know, he wasn't like, man, he was a massive, you know, powerhouse, but it was just what he had went through. And he himself said, torture, you know, after a certain point, pain and torture, you become numb to it. And I think that's what happened with Fish as well. But they're both different cases, like you said, one enjoyed it. Maybe Panzeram did enjoy it after a while, where he would piss off these jail guards to the point where they'd come in and beat him up, and he was like, yeah, whatever, I don't care, yeah, come on, hit me. I just want it, you know. Maybe he did want that attention. There was one thing I want to bring up about Andrew, and it, it was really heartbreaking, is when he tried to escape the prison in New York, and he made it to the top of the 30-foot wall. I guess it was a 30-foot wall on the top and then also on the bottom, and he fell and broke his leg and all that kind of stuff, and they gave him no medical attention. They just threw him back into his cell. At that point, after all that he's been through, I almost found myself saying, well, what if that had happened to me? What would that do to you, you know? And that, I think, is just, it's just sad. It's a sad state for someone to have to go through that. And can you, as a filmmaker, knowing all that stuff, can you blame him? 
Well, and that's the thing, you know, when it, 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 different people have different thoughts on the case. They say, well, if he was this criminal, you know, yeah, he deserved whatever he got. But again, I, I still think he was a human being, you know. And I did film. The, the, it was Clinton. It was called Clinton County Prison. It's way, not way up, it's upstate New York in Dannemora. Sometimes they call it Dannemora Prison because that, because that's the town. Even though I received permission to film outside this prison, I mean, this was the most depressing scene I've ever seen in my life. I don't know if many of you have actually seen a prison, but this was like Siberia. This was truly frightening. I mean, the town basically, it was the prison. I mean, there were, there were houses, but when you come, when you drive up to this prison, it seems like it goes on for miles. This wall and these guard towers, it, it's huge. You know, we filmed there in the winter, and even though I had permission, they still stopped us because there were different change of guards. So they would stop us. And there is, a, there is one book out, and I'm compiling um, more information to, to produce another book on Piantram with uh, much of the research materials like I've done with the Fish and Holmes book. But, you know, no one knew exactly what happened to him when he tried to escape that prison. But we were stopped by one of the guards, and I told him, I said, yeah, you know, here's what we're doing. And he said, you know, we still talk about that guy to this day, because he was the only one that had the balls to try and break out of this 30-foot wall prison. I mean, nobody would even attempt that now. And even then, you know, he said, and here's what happened. He had some, there was some fencing material that was in the yard. He made this makeshift ladder out of this rope and fencing material, threw it up to the top of the 30-foot wall, but it broke before he got over the wall. And that's when he fell and broke part of his ankles, ruptured, you know, part of his body. And, and, and they did. They just threw him in a cell without medical attention. But that's where his hatred grew to its peak. He even wanted, he had plans to start world wars between countries. And he could have, he, he, and he laid it out. He says, Here, here's how I could do it. Here's exactly how I would do it. You know, and, and again, you, you know, how can you, you know, uh, you know, deny that when, you know, somebody is treated that way. It's, and, and I did have sympathy <coughs> for him. And, and, you know, even though I can't prove that he did any of these murders other than that laundry form in at Leavenworth, if he didn't kill anyone, that makes the story even more fascinating because he was tortured and treated this way and created into this monster for what? For breaking into some people's houses? He didn't, you know, if he didn't kill anyone, that's even more of a lesson to us to treat each other better. And that's why he tried to impart on us, you know, when he did his autobiography. So, uh, what do you think about people like Rick Stanton who, uh, do you think that they're exploiting serial killers and exploiting the culture? I don't think so. You know, Rick, Rick Staten, he collects, uh, you know, all the serial killer murder of Elia. You know, he was always interested in it. But he was also Gacy's art dealer. And, you know, he would, he would cater to other people that were interested in it, whether they were horror fans or musicians or John Waters. I mean, there are many, I mean, John Waters, I, I think, believe owns a Gacy or two, and Johnny Depp and DiCaprio, I think, may own Gacy paintings. My college professor actually had a Gacy painting as well. Yeah. I mean, Stephen Giannangelo, the forensic psychologist, he owns a Gacy painting because they believe you could study some of these paintings and learn some of the psychology behind it. So, you know, I think, you know, he was doing a service, you know, and like he said, he didn't really make any money off of it. When I went to Rick State's home, Rick State is a mortician. That's how he earns his money. You know, that's his day job. So that was more of a hobby for him, you know, and, and he even admitted that it was a way for him to, you know, get in touch with other celebrities that were interested in buying this artwork. And he did start with Gacy and he moved on to different serial killers. So it wasn't like... He was putting ads in, you know, major magazines saying, oh, yeah, you know, serial killer portraits for sale and letters. You know, it was a personal, private thing for him and other collectors, you know, that he knew. So I don't think, you know, I don't think he was really exploiting it, you know. And, and you know, when you look, when you go to his place now, he has his whole collection in one room. And outside of that room, he has autographs from horror stars and, you know, horror movie posters and science fiction movie posters. You know, those were his interests. And like I said, that that was where this all stemmed from for me too. It was, you know, interest in horror films and, and these real life monsters that exist now. And in serial killer culture, it seemed to me some of the folks um, were glorifying serial killers and some people just had the one for, for knowledge and, and a history buff point of view. 
it, it seems to be a fine line. You seem to be the one that wants to give the information out to the history buffs and things like that. So how do you, when you make a movie, how do you really stay on that side of the line to not glorify them? Yeah, I try to be objective as possible. You know, what I do is when I'm researching, I look at the evidence and I, I don't want to bring my point of view into it. I want to look at it from a researcher perspective or a reporter, but sticking to the true facts. You know, like for instance, H.H. H. Holmes, I didn't know how to end that film. It's like, how do you end a film? You know, I'm not really a religious person, but how do you end a film about this guy that did all these atrocious things to other human beings and was an evil genius? So I just ended with his quote saying that he, you know, thought he was the devil. And it's like, you know, and, and it, you know, it, it, again, I, I try to lay it out, you know, more from a clinical perspective, but also, you know, um, have it, um, I don't know if I'd say enjoyable, but, you know, I, I don't want to make boring documentaries where it's a talking head in a picture, talking head in a picture. I want it more engaging. So I'll throw everything I can into it, you know, everything from newspaper clippings to reenactments to location footage, you know, just to make it interesting. You know, so, um, you know, I, it's not, it, it's not, I don't have a point of view on these people. I feel they've done what they've done. There, there must have been some reason. I, I don't think they just woke up one day and, and said, you know, I'm just going to start killing people. So through my research, I want to show, okay, here's where they've come from. Here's what they've done. Here's what a result of it was. And that's why I don't think I'd ever do a film on an, you know, unknown, uh, you know, un unsolved case like Jack the Ripper. Or, I mean, I would like to do Jack the Ripper if I focused on the crimes and it was like a feature film. That, I think, would be interesting, like a From Hell type thing. But, you know, as far as documentaries are concerned, I don't know if I would ever do an axe fan of New Orleans or these unsolved cases, because I, like many people, like the closure aspect of it. Okay, they were apprehended or executed. I mean, I don't believe in the death penalty because I believe we can, you know, hopefully learn things from these serial killers once they're in prison. You know, whether or not they like that attention, I think if they are truthful, you know, like a Dahmer, you know, we may be able to sit down with them and learn things from them. I heard that uh, Keith Jesperson actually contacted you uh, to tell his story. Uh, do you have plans to do that? Did you talk to him? You know, I, I didn't contact him back, and I don't collect murderabilia. That's the only piece of, if you would call it, murderabilia that I have. Um, you know, we, it, I was at an event in Indianapolis uh, years ago called the Crime Scene. And they received a letter. It was at Birdie's Bar. You know, I don't know if any of you are locals out here, but the event was held at Birdie's. And they received a letter from Oregon State Penitentiary. So when, I, when we arrived, you know, uh, Matthew Aaron, who was hosting the event, you know, I told him, okay, well, let me film you opening the envelope, and he uh, opened it, and it was from, oh, it's from Keith Jesperson, the happy face killer, you know, and he killed these prostitutes. And, uh, you know, he's starting to read it, your crime scene, I know Joe Hiles and some others that are here, but who I'm interested in is filmmaker John Borowski, I want him to make a film on my life. And when he said that, my heart, like, skipped a beat, and I'm filming, I'm like, what can I do? I can't stop filming. But I, I never contacted him back, you know, and, and I was just surprised that he knew about me and my work, you know, and, and, you know, wanted me to do a film on his life. But, you know, I'm more interested in the deep, deeply rooted psychological cases, and I'm sure he has issues as well, but, you know, some of these early cases, especially the extreme psychological cases, are the ones I'm more interested in than the, than the contemporaries. Now, before we get, uh, I want to take some questions from the audience. You had a pretty interesting run uh, with your new campaign on Facebook. Why don't you tell us about the new documentary you're going to want to work on and sort of what happened with Facebook? Yeah, it's, it's a little divergence from um, the serial killer documentaries. Um, I met an artist, uh, befriended on Facebook, uh, named Vincent Castiglia. And he's an artist based in New York. And he draws his own blood and paints in his own blood. So, um, and now he's doing this with celebrities. <coughs> Um, he did a portrait of Margaret Cho in her blood. So, you know, he, he drew, drew her blood and he did a portrait of her. And the, the first time I went to New York to meet him, you know, he offered to do my portrait. I'm like, well, hell yeah. You know, <laughs> so he, th he took 13 vials of my blood. So he's going to do my portrait in my blood. 
you know, which to me is fascinating. Now, you know, some people may say, well, this is a gimmick. Well, it would be if he wasn't such a talented artist. You know, he's very talented, you know, and, uh, you know, so I, I, you know, it all started actually on Facebook when we were talking and he threw out there, he said, well, you know, does anyone think I should do a reality show, you know, based on what I'm doing? And of course the reality show would follow him maybe with different celebrities, drawing their blood, doing portraits. And then I responded saying, well, how far can you go with that before, before it becomes boring or sensationalistic, you know? And, and I told him, you really deserve a, a feature documentary based on your life so people know why you're doing the work that you're doing, where you've come from. So again, it would just be a biography like these serial killers, you know, where did he come from, where is he at now, and where is he intending to go? I mean, there was never one artist other than Vincent Castiglia that had a showing at the H.R. Giger Museum, and I don't, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with Giger, more fans, you know, he created, you know, the alien, he designed the alien costume and much of the landscape for the alien films. And Vincent Castiglia had a you know, gallery showing there at, in Switzerland. And I thought, wow, you know, this is phenomenal. So he's truly talented. So um, we started a Kickstarter campaign uh, about a week ago. And, uh, you know, it started out really well, and, you know. And so if anyone's interested, the film's called Bloodlines, The Art and Life of Vincent Castiglia, and that's on Kickstarter now. And there are great perks, you know, so it's like if you do contribute, you get works from him, signed by him, you know, the more you invest. And if you have a ton of money, <laughs> if there's anyone here with a ton of money, I don't know, what, I think the tier is either a thousand or a couple grand. Yeah, I think there's one that starts at a thousand that you can have your portrait painted of yourself in his blood. <coughs> you would send him a picture and, you know, he would draw his blood and paint your portrait, which is, I mean, you know, he's like a modern day, you know, Rembrandt or Michelangelo, and I thought, wow, this is phenomenal, and it's, it's a cool opportunity for people to become involved with the project. So to make a long story short, we started the fundraiser, and then someone on Facebook, you know, <coughs> all artists use to promote their work, someone must have taken objection to something. Now, his images aren't really political, I mean, they're not sexual in nature, they're, they're devoid of those issues. So somebody took offense to something and, you know, reported it. So then, you know, I woke up, I think it was uh, the other day, it was three or four days into the fundraising campaign, and all traces of the links to the Kickstarter campaign were removed. And you could not, I could not post links or send them in messages. It was like they never existed. So, you know, and I thought, okay, you know, how could this happen? So I immediately called the Facebook phone number Call the Facebook phone number and see what happens. It's, this is an actual, and it's not an actual phone number. Go to the Facebook page and you know, you know, find you know, find a way to, to message us, which there is no way. You know, there's no email. You know, I, and I finally discovered it. It's like you know, I've been on Facebook for a long time, but it's like, wait, how can you run a company when you don't have a phone number, don't have an email, don't have an address, don't have a way to contact this company? I'm like, wait, this company's collecting all of our information and data. There, there's no way we can even contact them if something goes wrong or if we, even if we had a question. So that was very scary to me. So, you know, again, <coughs> the, you know, the aggressive, you know, reporter slash journalist slash filmmaker that I was, I found out that Facebook had an office in Chicago. So I put on a suit and tie and I went down to their office. Uh, the elevator only went up to 19. They were on 23, so I took the freight elevator up there knocked on their door, they opened the door, and they're like, oh, do you have an appointment? I'm like, well, no, but you know, it was very nice. There was a young man that came out. He said, well, here's my situation. I gave him my films, you know, and he said, well, I'm not sure what I could do, but I'll look into it. And about four hours later, it was cleared up, and I, I think, you know, he was instrumental in clearing that up. Like, all the links were reinstated again. And he said, well, it's not Facebook. It's really all automatic. It's bots. And I said, well, it is Facebook. If Facebook has a policy, that anyone could go on there and report something, you know, asinine. And, and, you know, this is a major documentary on a major American artist done by another, you know, artist. There was no reason why any of this should have been blocked. And, you know, and I told him, you know, these things have to change. So if I draw attention to that, sometimes these things happen for a reason. And, you know, it created a, uh, some controversy because even though those links were down, people were still contributing. So, you know, and the links are up now, so you can contribute. Uh, any questions from the audience for John? 
you gotta have questions. Serial killers, horror films, everything. Who's your favorite serial killer and why? Who's my favorite serial killer and why? I know that's always a weird question. You know, sometimes people are like, wait, who is, wait, what, you have a favorite? You know? It's like, who's your favorite horror film star? Well, my favorite horror film star is Vincent Price, it is. But, um, and if Vincent Price was still alive, he would have done the narration of H.H. H. Holmes. And, uh, you know, I love his voice. But it, I think it has to be H.H. H. Holmes. You know, I mean, because again, he, you know, he was America's first documented serial killer. And I get these, you know, people that, you know, want message board. Well, he wasn't America's first serial killer. Well, sure, we had the bloody benders in America, which were before him, but they disappeared. There was no actual case. There was no trial. There was no case on these people. So he was not only America's first documented, but when you think about it, everything that he did, all the ones that came after him, you know, it all go back to the groundwork that he laid. So for me, it would have to be this intense fascination with H.H. H. Holmes and the genius that he was and the master manipulator. Um, what do you think about Earthbit Bathory and would you ever do a documentary on her? Yeah, Bathory, you know, Bathory's story is very interesting. Uh, she would uh, bathe uh, in the blood of, I think, it, I don't know if it was just females or if it was virgins, you know, trying, trying to, uh, you know, enhance her youth. And I am, and, and then I'm at that point now where, okay, do I go further back in time or do I go further ahead in time from, you know, early 1900s? And I'm still debating that, you know, I'm still trying to figure out, you know, who I may be, you know, interested in doing next. One I'm definitely interested in is around the time of Bathory is Gildy Ray, you know, and, and he was, he actually fought alongside Joan of Arc in the Crusades. Um, but eventually he was this nobleman that would send his servants down to the, uh, you know, villagers' uh, lands and, you know, kidnap their children and, you know, he would basically, you know, rape and murder all these children. And there was a big trial, there's a book out called The Trial of Gildy Ray, where, you know, they talk about the trial and the things that he did. And so I don't know if I want to go further back or a little further ahead in time. So that's kind of where I'm at. I'm also, um, writing a feature film that I can't discuss too much, but it's going to be along, uh, you know, the true crime kind of, uh, you know, uh, category in, in that sense. Not based on any serial killer that we know, but kind of building on what I've learned from these, you know, Carol killers and true crime. Uh, we're just about out of time. Uh, let everybody know where they can find you on the web, get your movies. Yeah, you know, if you just uh, type my name, johnmorowski.com, that's my website, or, uh, you know, you could just look up any of these serial killers, you know, or I think if you just type serial killer documentary, I'll probably come up, you know, at the top somewhere. Um, and I also have several books. I have a book on Holmes and Fish, and I'm uh, working on a book on cancer and McGee because I, I'm trying to get to that point where every time I release a film, there's a book to accompany it, which has the research files that, you know, I've discovered, you know, researching the films. Thanks everybody for coming out. Thank you.